Thanks very much. Um, the ranking member has stepped out for a second, but I'm going to go ahead and proceed with uh, my questions. Uh, Ms. Orsky, let me go back to the quote about the threat of climate change that you use in your testimony. <laughs> Sometimes it takes a few calamity howlers to wake people up to the fact that there are serious problems and to arouse people to the point where they're willing to do something about it. I think we are at that point now. Again, who said that? Lee Dubridge, the science advisor to President Richard Nixon in 1969. Thank you. Um, you are involved in the study of the fossil fuel disinformation campaign and have been for many years. You are not alone. Could you describe for us the academic study of the fossil fuel disinformation operation how roughly many scientists are engaged in it, how robust uh, the science is on this subject. And um, what, why don't you answer that first, and then I'll ask sure. the second part okay. of the question. And thank you for that question. And thank you also for the opportunity to set the record straight about my own qualifications. So I'm trained as an earth scientist. I have a PhD from the School of Earth Sciences at Stanford University. And as you noted at the outset, I'm also an affiliated professor of earth and planetary sciences at Harvard University, and I have published numerous papers in peer-reviewed scientific journals on climate science, particularly on the statistics of temperature records, because I have formal training in statistics. Uh, today, I am employed, like Roger, as a social scientist, but I consider that to be um, a form of science. And so I didn't start out to work in this area. My work is in the history of science. I'm interested in the development of scientific knowledge. And I was studying the development of climate science knowledge as a scientific question. And I was doing that work in the early 2000s when there was not really a scientific field of studying uh, this question of disinformation. It became clear to me from my historical research that the scientific evidence for the reality and potential severity of man-made climate change was very deep that it went back. Um, My question I, is more about the disinformation yeah, campaign so, okay, about yeah, the climate sure, change. So, so if you right. could focus on that in the short time I have. Sure, I'll try. Thank you. Sorry for that. Um, so I published a paper in 2004 called The Scientific Consensus on Climate Change, where I documented this consensus. As a result of that paper, I became a target of the disinformation campaign. I started getting hate mail. I had people file complaints against me at my university and went through some unpleasant experiences as well. And you're and not so, alone in that. People like Michael Mann have also been the subject of correct. Uh, what I attacks. learned as I started to investigate that I was not alone, and that in fact there was a network of people who were attacking climate scientists like Ben Santer, like Michael Mann and like myself. And so that experience of being attacked led me to try to understand what these attacks were, who was funding them, who was behind them, and why they were doing it. And, and over- so As a scientist, how would you describe the state of the science that looks at the climate disinformation campaign as a phenomenon? Is well, it just yeah. in its nascent stage? Is it fairly robust? Is there a scientific consensus? Is it passing clear peer review? What are the, what are the markers of yeah. how real it all is? So I'd say that the field is mature now. So it was nascent in the early 2000s. It's been around for about 20 years now. Uh, we're academics. We mostly publish in peer-reviewed scientific literature, although we also um, publish books and opinion pieces. I'd say it's a well-developed network now of academics, both in the United States and elsewhere, and there are now many scores of academic researchers who study this as an empirical problem, as a scientific problem. Let me shift to Ms. Arena for a moment. Uh, your testimony makes comparisons between uh, the tobacco industry's campaign of fraud and what the fossil fuel industry is doing these days. Could you elaborate a little bit on that comparison between uh, the tobacco campaign to deny the dangers of its product and the fossil fuel campaign to deny the dangers of its product? Sure, there are many uh, parallels. First, uh, first and foremost, the denial that the products in question are dangerous to people, the denial of the science. Um, for the tobacco industry, as Dr. Riskies knows better than I, uh, that was a 50-year campaign 
uh, for fossil fuels. It took a very long time before corporations uh, acknowledged the reality of climate change, let alone acknowledge that it was human-driven, let alone acknowledge that it was the burning of fossil fuels that is primarily responsible for that climate change. Um, second, uh, tobacco companies really took advantage of uh, the opportunity to market filtered and light cigarettes to almost seizing the lung cancer link as a business opportunity. And we do see uh, fossil fuel companies doing something very similar with uh, carbon capture technology, with other uh, green solutions uh, that they try to market, uh, in, in a sense, defending their core business model. Now, I'm not saying carbon capture should not be scaled. It absolutely should. Uh, but really, we see you're a lot You're talking as an expert on marketing, and you're talking about the marketing campaign. Exactly. And so we see a similar marketing tactics and a similar denial approach, um, attacking science, for, then questioning the science, then hiring their own experts, um, and then really taking advantage of market opportunities. Ranking Member Grassley.